Father, you're worthy of our praise, our applause, our thanksgiving and gratitude because we can sing with truthfulness that we are redeemed. That because of Jesus, we're not who we used to be, but also because of Jesus, we are not yet who we will be in Christ. And Father, we pray this morning that you would give us a hunger and a thirst for you that we would open up our lives and allow your word and your spirit to apply truth, to, to penetrate through all the barriers, all the, uh, all the stuff that's in the way. And we would yield our lives to you. Speak to us now, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the book of Matthew chapter 26. Uh, we're going to be in Matthew 26. If you don't have a Bible with you, grab one of the, the Bibles in the pews around you. They look just like this one. Turn to page 1058, uh, and you will find Matthew 26 and the story that we're going to be looking at this morning. Hey, while you're turning there, uh, a couple of things. First of all, I drove by the property. don't know if you have, but uh, they've actually started pouring the footings. And uh, yeah, real progress is happening. You'll start seeing a structure going up pretty soon, and and uh, that's exciting because uh, that way we can address our parking problem, and uh, at least uh, for a little while, and, and people won't get tickets for going to church. Uh, by the way, I, did, uh, I had this great idea, and I checked with Pastor Chet, and he said that we could not use benevolence money to pay for your tickets. So uh, just, uh, I, I really wanted to, but uh, anyway, the, but it, it is exciting about the building going up and just keep praying. It's all in God's time, and it'll happen uh, as uh, He makes it happen. Just pray that the, the way would be smooth and that the people who are building the building would be safe as, uh, as they do the work. Hey, one other thing I want to tell you about. Uh, in two weeks from this weekend, we start our sign-ups for the next session of Life Groups. And uh, we want everyone to be in a life group because life change happens in the context of small groups where people are studying God's word and sharing their lives and serving together. And, uh, and if you're not in a life group, that's a time when you can sign up for life groups. And, and we're trying something new this spring session. We're going to offer our regular sermon-based series. Um, and and uh, we're also going to offer a seven-week married life study. So uh, if you are interested in that, we're going to have groups just for that. If you're in a life group, you don't have to switch out of your life group. Your group can study the married life. Uh, if you're not in a life group and you want to be in a regular life group, they're going to be available. If you want to be in a married life group, there's going to be some just for that session that you can sign up and check it out. And, and uh, the thing is, here at Calvary, we want to strengthen families. We want to strengthen uh, homes. And, and so uh, we're inviting you to invest in your marriage. And if you're looking at your relationship and going, ah, oh, it's pretty good. Or if you're looking at your relationship and going, no, it's not. Uh, either way, this is an opportunity for you to make it better. And uh, Life Group's one night a week, uh, about an hour and a half, and we're going to challenge you to invest in your relationship intentionally. Information is in your bulletin. You'll be hearing more about that. I just am a huge fan of Life Groups, and I know it'll make a difference in your life if you check it out. So wanted you to be thinking about that. I wanted the couples to be talking about that, saying, hey, let's do this. What night is going to work for us? Because there'll be groups meeting all different kinds of times during the week. That said... Who is the most interesting person that you have ever personally met? I'm not talking about admiring or respecting from a distance. I'm talking about face-to-face. -face. Who's the most fascinating person that you've ever been in the presence of and had a conversation with? You have 30 seconds to tell your neighbor. Ready, set, go. <laughs> All right, some of you have really fascinating friends because you guys are still talking, and others of you apparently need to get out more. Uh, today we're kicking off a series called Person of Interest, and uh, we're not talking about suspects in crimes, 
But, uh, but we are talking about people who are present in many of the legal accounts of Scripture. Uh, these are people who are connected to Jesus and the story of his arrest and trial and crucifixion and resurrection. Uh, they are the key players, the difference makers in uh, what Scripture records uh, about these world-changing events. And I believe that God lets us see real people in the Bible so that we can learn from them. Whether we see their lives extensively or just a glimpse, that we can see them and, and we can kind of learn lessons from how they live their life, uh, either things to avoid or things to imitate. And, and so we're going to be uh, taking a look at these people over the next few weeks as we walk towards Easter. Uh, now, some of these people were good, some were bad, most were a little bit of both. And today we're looking at a man that most of you are probably not familiar with his name. Uh, his name is Caiaphas. And Caiaphas, you'll probably know him by his title because he was the high priest. The high priest at the time of Jesus' crucifixion. Uh, Matthew 26, verses 57 through 68, we're going to look at that in just a moment. Let me set the scene up for you. This is the same night that they celebrated the Last Supper on. So Jesus had met with the 12, he'd, he'd uh, they'd eaten the Passover meal, he had uh, said this uh, bread is my body which is broken for you, this cup is my blood which is shed for the forgiveness of sins. And, and then he said, one of you is going to betray me, and all of you are going to abandon me. And Peter brashly says, I'll never, even if I have to die with you, and Jesus reminds him that before the morning, you know, you're going to deny me three times. They go to the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus pours his heart out to the Father and says, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, your will be done. Judas arrives with the temple guards and betrays Jesus with a kiss. Jesus is arrested, and that's where the story picks up today. Uh, verse 57, Matthew 26. Then those who had seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders had gathered. Now, actually, this isn't like an, uh, a kind of a courthouse kind of place. This is actually Caiaphas' home. It's kind of his palace, uh, if you will. And it still stands to this day, or parts of it do, in Jerusalem. And you can see the places where they believe he, that Jesus was held uh, as a captive while he was there. Uh, so it's his home. It's the home of Caiaphas. And Peter was following him at a distance as far as the courtyard of the high priest. And going inside, he sat down with the guards to see the end. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death. But they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At last, two came forward and said, This man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and said, Have you no answer to make? What is it these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, You have said so. But I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has uttered blasphemy. What further witnesses do we need? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your judgment? And they answered, He deserves death. Then they spit in his face and struck him, and some slapped him, saying, Prophesy to us, you Christ. Who is it that struck you? We know from Scripture that the religious leaders, the chief priests, had been observing the movement of Jesus and what was happening. We know they perceived Jesus as a threat because they paid Judas to betray him. And they had Jesus arrested and brought before them, not so they could learn something, but simply so they could condemn Jesus to death. As I read this account again, these scriptures again, and, and many of us have read this many times, we've been familiar with this story, I was struck by one question that I could not let go of. It just, it, it, it kind of has haunted my soul all, well, for several weeks. 
And and I pray that it kind of haunts your soul as you leave this place today. How did the high priest of God miss God when he was standing right in front of him? When he was face to face with him? How did the high priest of God miss God in the flesh when he was face to face with him? I mean, think about this. Caiaphas is the highest spiritual authority in Judaism. I mean, there's nobody who's above him. He is a direct descendant from Aaron, the first priest, high priest. You know, Moses and Aaron, those guys. I I mean, he spent his life studying the scriptures. He he oversees all the activities in the temple. He is like the top dog. Everybody looks to him as the spiritual leader. Once a year, he goes into the Holy of Holies with a sacrifice and makes atonement for the people of Israel and their sins. He is the one who's supposed to represent the people to God and God to the people. He's in that position. I mean, the place where he oversees and works and spends most of his time has the Holy of Holies, which the Jews believed was the place where God dwelled on this earth. And yet, here he was, that person who is supposed to know God. And he is face to face, no further than we are, from God in the flesh. And he's clueless. And, I, and, and as I thought about this and as I lo- read the scene over and over and over again, I just thought, how in the world could he do that? I mean, it's not like Jesus showed up out of nowhere. I mean, for three years, he'd been doing a public ministry from Galilee down to Jerusalem and points beyond. And, and, and he you know, taught with authority and he performed miracles with thousands of witnesses. And yet Caiaphas never seems to consider the possibility, even when Jesus answers the question, are you the Christ of God? By the way, Jesus' answer basically means you've already said it yourself. I am. I am. And, and, and the high priest tears his, his robes, which is a sign of disgust, and declares it blasphemy when Jesus utters the truth. How did Caiaphas miss God when God was right in front of him? Kind of came up with three answers. Choices, values that that Caiaphas made that instruct us so hopefully we won't be like him. So hopefully we won't miss the living God when he's right in front of us. So how did Caiaphas miss God when he's right in front of him? First of all, Caiaphas valued title over authority. Value title over authority. He was the high priest. He was the man. He was the big dog. He was the show. There was nobody more important in all of Judaism than he was. And to Caiaphas, that's what mattered. He had the title. He had the position. He wanted everyone to know it. He could not even conceive that someone could be more important than him. Especially not a nobody from Nazareth. If God was going to work He was going to do it through Caiaphas because he was first in line. And yet Jesus, according to scriptures, taught as one having authority. Not like the scribes and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And we know that Jesus had authority over creation because he calmed the wind and the waves with one sentence. Peace, be still. We know that Jesus had authority over evil spirits because he cast them out of people time and time again. We know Jesus had authority over human bodies because he gave sight to the blind. He made the lame to walk. We know that Jesus had authority over death because he had just raised Lazarus from the dead. See, Jesus had authority. Caiaphas valued position and title. So I want you to know something today. God is not impressed by our titles. He's not impressed by our positions or our achievements or our accolades. He really doesn't want to stand and admire your plaques on the wall or certificates of excellence. In fact, I don't have any authority as a pastor because I got an office with my name on the door. I don't have authority as a pastor because I have degrees hanging on the wall. I don't even have any authority because of the title 
pastor. I mean, come on, any idiot can call himself a pastor or a bishop or a reverend or, or a spiritual authority, right? And, and let's be honest, many do. <laughs> the only authority any of us have is the Holy Spirit of God, knowledge of the Word of God, and living life with the character of Jesus. That's it. You want to know what gives anybody an authority? The Holy Spirit of God, the Word of God, and the character of Christ. That's what gives somebody authority. See, at Calvary, we're not impressed by titles, and we don't give people titles and positions because we want to uh, you know, lift them up. What we do is we see people who are living their life in a way that reflects the authority of Christ, and we ask them if they would lead others as well. So Caiaphas valued titles over authority. What do you value? What's important to you? Do you desire a title or a position, or do you want to live in the authority of God? Caiaphas valued titles over authority, and he missed the living God. And then Caiaphas loved tradition more than redemption. He loved tradition more than redemption. See, Jesus said, the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus, in John 3.17, you guys know John 3.16, right? In John 3.17, continuing that thought, he said, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Jesus is all about redemption. That's what he does. He, he wants to find the lost. He wants to heal the sick. He wants to change people's lives. He wants to redeem our brokenness. But Caiaphas, well, he's all about tradition. Because that tradition protected Caiaphas' position and his power and his wealth, his status. So any threat to his tradition, like say... Some guy from Galilee that's drawing lots of crowds and performing all these cool miracles has to be eliminated because he's got to protect the tradition. We love our traditions, don't we? Notice I said our. Our traditions. We love our traditions. And churches tend to love their traditions. That's why this country is overrun with dying churches filled with people who are protecting tradition. Who are defending their preferences, their power, and their status. And they're missing out on the power of God to redeem lives. And it is a tragedy just as great as Caiaphas missing the living God. That's why here at Calvary one of our core values is change. (laughs) If you're new to Calvary... That's right. One of our core values, and we have four of them, one of our core values is change. Because we believe it is impossible to follow Jesus and stay where you are. After all, Jesus said to the crowds, what did he say? Follow me. He didn't tell them where you're going, didn't tell them how long it was going to take, didn't tell them how comfortable it was going to be. He just said, follow me. I'm going to lead you to life. I'm going to lead you to purpose. I'm going to lead you to heaven. Follow me. It's a dynamic call that is wild and unpredictable. And here's what we know. If we follow Jesus, he's going to change our lives. It's going to happen. It's a reality. And, and the crazy thing is in churches, we celebrate that. We want to see people saved. We want to see people's lives changed. We want to hear the testimonies of, of how lost we were and now we're found. And we celebrate individual change. And then we get together as people whom God is changing and calling to follow him. And we become the people who defend the status quo. Does that make any sense at all? No, and so we become staunch defenders of what is. Like we can't change anything to honor the God who calls us to a life of constant change. That's why change is one of our core values. Because it is impossible to follow Jesus as individuals or a church and stay where you are. So that means at Calvary we will always value redemption over tradition. Do you know what that means? That means if you like something, really, really like something, eventually we're going to change it. (laughs) I'm just telling you right now, right up front. 
Because change is one of our core values. So you go, I like the worship styles. I like the worship times. I like the worship order. I know we messed with that last week, didn't we? Hey, by the way, those are the top three things that churches fight about. Isn't that crazy? If you like those things, we're going to change them at some point. If you like a ministry, you go, oh, this ministry is awesome. It really is helping me. Or a study that you're doing, yeah, it's going to change. I'm just telling you right now, it's going to change. Not because we want to upset you. We don't want to upset you. We happen to be really good at doing that, but we don't want to do it. We want to make everybody happy. We just know that we want to make God happier. And so, you know, we don't intend to upset you, but it's going to be altered. It's going to change because our mission is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. And anything that we can do to help that mission, to do it more effectively, to do it better, we will do it. No matter what tradition we have to trample in the process. Because we value redemption more than tradition. So what traditions do you have that get in the way of you experiencing God's power? What traditions in your life, what attitudes, what habits, what patterns, what values are you trying to defend from God's voice wanting to change those so that he can redeem your life? Because if you're anything like me at all, God's speaking into your life saying, hey, I want that. I want you to lay that down because it's killing you. I want you to give that up because it's hampering your life. I, I want you to surrender that so that I can redeem you. Caiaphas missed Jesus because he loved tradition more than redemption. And because he valued title over authority. And Caiaphas missed the living God because he desired the praise of men more than the praise of God. How do I know that? The Apostle John tells us that. John chapter 12, he says, Nevertheless, many, even of the authorities, believed in Jesus. But for fear of the Pharisees, they didn't confess it. So they would not be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. The religious leaders, now this isn't directly about Caiaphas, but this is about religious leaders, and it says, hey, the, the religious culture of that day, of those people, said that we value the praise of men more than the praise of God. Now, who happens to be the top dog of that religious culture? Caiaphas. And the, the leader is the one who has the power to change things. He has the power to either affirm and protect the culture or he has the power to change the culture and challenge it. And the culture is one of we want the applause of men more than the applause of God. And Caiaphas is the guy in charge of it. He's guilty. You see, they had a culture where they loved the praise of men. They loved the accolades, the attaboys, the affirmation of their peers and the people. If we're honest, it is an ever-present temptation for us to seek the approval of people rather than God. There's someone in everyone's life that you want to hear, good job. I'm proud of you. Way to go. You're a success. Good decision. It may be your spouse, it may be your parents, it may be your kids, it, it may be some friends, it may be your boss, it may be people at church. It, you see, there's someone that you really want to hear that from, because it feels good. And we're always tempted to do what they want rather than what God wants us to do. And yet, it is an empty life that is lived by reading one's own press clippings. It is meaningless when you, the highlight of your day is admiring your own plaques and trophies. And, and you know what? Here, I'm just going to give you the illustration. This is where you see where that road leads to in the end if you follow it. You have to look no further than Hollywood. Now you think about this. Hollywood, these successful people, these people that, that receive the applause of men tremendously, Right? And what do they have over and over and over and over again, especially this time of year? Award shows. Hey, guys, 
since we're so wonderful, beautiful, creative, genius people, let's get together and award ourselves. Because, hey, think about it. We're not invited, right? They didn't invite you and say, hey, come tell us how great we are. They didn't, put, they didn't invite me to come to those things. No, they all get together and have a self-congratulatory celebration. <laughs> because they need the applause of men. Uh, there's so many of them that are living for that applause. And when the applause f- falls silent, their lives become meaningless. And there's a lot of us who are living life that way, who, who need somebody to applaud us and praise us and, and tell us good job. And, and the thing is, that leads to nowhere. But the praise of God is better. The affirmation of God satisfies our souls. It gives us joy in the difficult times. It gives us purpose and meaning. That's why the Apostle Paul in Galatians 1.10, one of my favorite verses, says, Am I now seeking the approval of man or God? Or am I trying to please men? If I'm trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. You see, this is about our identity. Are you identifying with people so that you can hear their praise and their applause? Or are you identifying your life as a servant of the living God who wants to please him and one day hear, Well done good and faithful servant. Whose affirmation are you living for? Whose approval do you crave? Are you living to please people or Jesus? See, if it's people, you're going to miss the living God. Caiaphas missed God when he was face to face with God in the flesh, in the person of Jesus. How tragic. How sad. I pray today that you open your eyes to the reality of the living God. And you invite him to change you. I want to close with this thought. Because it's kind of been rooted in my soul for the last couple of weeks. I don't want us to be here and have anyone miss God. And Caiaphas was a deeply religious man, and yet he missed Jesus. And some of you may be coming to church because it's the right thing to do, because you got in the habit, because you like hanging out with people with values and morals and are pro-family and are a lot of fun, and, and, and maybe you wandered in or maybe you've been doing this for a long time, and today you realize that you've been religious, but you've never really surrendered your life to Jesus. You've never said, Jesus, you're the son of God and you're the savior of the world and I need you to forgive me and my life is your life. And right now, you just sense the Holy Spirit talking to you and just kind of saying, hey, you need to make this decision. You need, to, you need to do this. You need to get baptized. You need to tell the whole world you're my follower. And you're thinking, yeah, but what, what's my spouse going to think? What are my friends going to think? What, what, what's, what are, what's my work going to think? What, what are my kids going to think? Let me just tell you something. It doesn't matter what anybody thinks but God and God alone. Please don't miss out on the living God because he's here. He's not in the flesh, but he's here. Jesus said, we're two or more gathered. I'm present. I don't want you to miss him. Will you pray with me? Father, today we just simply ask that you'd open our eyes. And let us see you in your power, in your glory, in in your grace and your mercy. Because we need you. And Lord, we don't want anyone to miss you. Including ourselves. So reveal to us who we are and who we're listening to and who we're trying to please. And what we're really trying to seek. Because only you can make our hearts full. And only you can give us that joy and that purpose in life. And today, we simply want to hunger for you more. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and worship our God together.